Yes, uh, thank you guys for having me, and thanks to all the sponsors and everyone organizing the event. It's an amazing office and amazing space. Uh, so my name is Michael. I'm the co-founder of a company called Active Theory, and I love JavaScript, and I love the flexibility of the language and how uh, I can bend it for the type of work that we, that we create, and that's sort of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, let's see here. Cool. Let's see if this video will play. Cool. So this is some of the work that we do, uh, some recent work. We're focusing primarily on uh, high-performance 3D graphics with WebGL. Um, we want our work to work on like a bunch of different devices from high-end desktops to lower-end mobile phones and everything in between. Um, and so I'm going to talk today about uh, some of the tricks that we use with JavaScript in order to make this uh, a reality. Cool. So uh, disclaimer, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, I've been making this up for, I don't know, six or seven years now. Um, I don't think, like, I think programming is a learned skill, not a born talent. So I think, you know, all of these things I'm going to talk about, they just started as ideas and they were iterated on. Um, and I think that kind of goes for a lot of things. Um, so this is what a class in our framework looks like. Um, and it was actually created back before ES6 classes were even a thing. Um, back then, this was like 2012-ish, 2011, uh, classes were comprised of attaching functions to squiggly bracket object definitions. You might remember that. Um, and so I was actually inspired by action script classes when I created the structure. Um, and we actually still use this, this now instead of ES6 classes um, because it gives us you know, uh, inheritance, private functions, little mini constructor there, some public functions. And uh, you we'll use it as you'd expect. Um, create a class and call a function on it. Um, let's see, so uh, we also have getters and setters um, quite easily implemented with our component inherited, a class that's inherited. Um, and when ES6 came out, we started adding functionality for, you know, you obviously went from everything being var to now having var const and let. Um, and I was actually inspired a bit by Swift and Kotlin, so I actually used these keywords semantically, so var being a class level variable sort of denoted with an underscore, a const being something like number of particles that's used uh, in a loop, um, and then let I like to use inside of uh, private functions. Um, we can simulate different patterns. So a singleton uh, being able to, uh, a singleton gets initialized when the instance function is called, um, and a static is like initialized immediately at runtime, and then you have access to its properties. Um, so that's sort of the, that's the boring stuff. Now we get into good stuff. So, uh, JavaScript engines, there's a great YouTube video that you should check out, JavaScript engines, how do they even? Um, JavaScript engines are pretty fascinating topics, like JavaScript itself is pretty magic, right? So um, when you look, you're sort of like looking around sort of the ends of the universe into the JavaScript engine to see how this world that we work in exists. Um, and by doing that, you sort of learn how to write optimized code. Um, so the idea is you want to pretend it's a static language when you can. Um, and you can always bend the rules because that's the whole point of JavaScript, really, um, when, where flexibility is more important than speed. Um, but if you do this, your engine will, the engine will optimize the machine code that actually runs on the CPU. So an example is an array. Um, if you can make your array all have the same type, it's gonna be, the code is gonna run faster on the CPU than if you have an array that has an integer float and a string. Uh, same thing when you're uh, adding, uh, sorry, calling functions and passing in parameters. If you can always pass in the same type of parameter, the code's going to run faster than if you change the type of parameter. Uh, and big one is you definitely don't want to have undefines in your array. That slows down the JavaScript engine uh, significantly. Uh, variable definitions as well. If you define a variable and it's a string, keep that variable a string if you can. Um, otherwise, if you change that definition, you're going to get deoptimized. All right, so now getting into some more specific stuff about what we do. So um, one of the things we do is we rely on request animation frames. Does everybody know, like familiar with request animation frame and like use it? Okay, cool. Uh, if you don't, it's the idea that it's going to run once a frame and paint uh, your paint, paint the browser once a frame, like in sync with your device screen. Um, the thing with request animation frame, though, is there's actually a little bit of a performance hit when you initialize it, and the browser has to schedule the next call. So we only make one request animation frame call per frame. Um, our, the rest of our code will actually be like we'll we'll manage our own render class, which will then call. Uh, each function that's waiting to be called on our own, as opposed to making a bunch of independent request animation frame calls. 
And we do the same thing for timers. So instead of using set timeout, uh, which will give you that same little scheduling hit, and you can imagine if you're doing a website that's got like a bunch of animations and things that are timed, um, it'll sort of those will stack up and, and hurt your performance. So what we'll do is we'll store a timers in an array. Uh, you run through that array and you add the delta each frame to the sort of current time on that one. And when that elapsed time is greater than the requested time, you trigger the callback and it's done. So I'll uh, get into uh, concurrency. So another great video is uh, YouTube async patterns to scale your multi-core JavaScript elegantly, or uh, the idea that we don't want to do this. We want, we want our code to run a little better than that. Um, so, so here's an example. Um, we, we, we use web workers a lot. Um, I'll get into, get into why in a second, but this, this is an example where we abstract uh, the web worker class into our own uh, class called thread. Uh, so you create a, a thread class and pass in another class whose code you want to run on the web worker. And from the main thread, you can call functions on the thread object that exists in that class. Uh, so here you can see I've defined a function called run on the thread. Uh, when I call on the main thread down on the bottom there, I say await oh, thread.run. That's going to go up to the thread. Thread's going to calculate the Fibonacci sequence and then return with this dope new async await pattern um, and give you a result. The idea here is that the main thread continues on smoothly while the web worker class is busy chewing on math, which we have to deal with quite frequently. Uh, so, so behind the scenes, this is sort of how this works roughly. This is just some pseudocode. Um, so you get the Fibonacci class by calling toString on the constructor. Um, you replace every instance of this with the keyword self because that's uh, what the web worker global object is. Um, and then on the main thread, you attach a method to the, that thread class object uh, with the same name. So it just gives you a nice little shortcut. And then uh, you basically create a worker and post message that stringified code to it. Um, that code gets over to the worker there at the top if e.data.code, and then that gets evaled. So then that same code, you've basically put it from the main thread onto your web worker. Um, and then later on, you, when you make a call, for in, in the case of the Fibonacci sequence, by calling run, you're telling the worker to look for a specific function. So it does some plumbing. It sends a message saying, hey, run this function and pass this data into it. It also passes uh, an ID into it, and that ID gets matched up when your work is done, it goes back to the main thread, um, it resolves that async promise, and you've essentially offloaded your work and got a response. Um, so yeah, this one's combining performance tricks, and, and in this case, we're using threads to decode images. Uh, so when you load an image in the browser, especially if you're trying to like, do a bunch, bunch of uh, like textures for WebGL, you're gonna get a stutter as the browser decodes the image and then uploads it to the GPU. Um, but this newer feature called create image bitmap exists, so what we're able to do is uh, move the decoding of that image off to a thread. And um, the goal there, of course, is to keep the main thread um, at 60 frames per second. So um, decode image works by fetching the image, uh, running, waiting for a blob, passing that blob in, into the create image bitmap function, and then sending that message back to the main thread and it knows how to deal with it. And since we're dealing with a lot of 3D models, we have like large JSON files. So um, arrays that are full of numbers that have to be parsed. Um, and it's similar to image decoding. You load a big geometry, you're gonna get a hitch. So uh, moving it to its own thread is gonna avoid that hitch. Um, and you, know, you might say, how is it possible to get such a large buffer of numbers from a, from a web worker back to the main thread without that hitch? And that's called uh, transferable objects, which is basically instead of stringifying an array and passing it back to the main thread, what it's going to do is you create a typed array. In this case, it's these float32 arrays for the position normal in UV. Um, the, when, by, by passing in the pass position buffer, normal buffer, UV buffer as an array, what that's going to do is tell the post message function that I'm trying to use transferable objects. And the ownership of that typed array is transferred back to the main thread. So then afterwards, if I was going to try to access the position array, it actually wouldn't exist and throw an error. Because what's happening is the web worker, in, underneath the browser, is taking ownership of the array in the web worker and pointing the memory to it for the main thread. Uh, so that way, it, the main thread has access to it, and it's passed instantly without any copying. And, and that's the big thing. Um, and uh, currently, I think browsers are doing a lot to implement like better memory usage. So um, work's being done, I believe, so that way you can continue to access um, the float thread, like a, a typed array on the web worker and the main thread at the same time. So race conditions will become a thing. Um, uh, 
So over time, um, we, as we decided to thread more and more things, thread all the things, like it, it was the idea to m make the performance a bit better and, and, and like the main thread's running great and everything's threaded. The problem now though, is that we have all of these different uh, utilities that are threaded and they're, um, we're now paying an upfront performance hit on initialization and then the thread remains mostly idle. Um, you decode an image upfront and then that's it. Um, so to solve this, we created a concept called shared threads. And the idea here that, um, is that code spawns on one thread for each CPU core. Um, and then if you have a function, uh, you would call the static thread upload method. Um, so in this case, thread upload parse geometry. Uh, similar to that class example from before, it just takes the code that's inside that function, runs it on a, uh, sends it up to the thread, the thread evals it, and now that function is available to be called. So later on, um, you can say thread.shared parse geometry and then that single function will get called on the shared thread, and this allows us to pool things like you know, decoding images and, and um, uh, parsing geometry all together um, on threads that don't have to be initialized and destroyed. So semaphores are a pretty uh, interesting one that's kind of a, a newer thing that we've been getting into. Um, this this concept is called a, a render worker. So this executes a callback as many times as it can within an allotted amount of time. So in this example, four milliseconds. And this is useful for things you can't thread away, such as manipulating the DOM. Um, so for example, if some class took uh, two milliseconds to initialize and you wanted to initialize 100 of them, uh, that would be a 200 millisecond hitch that you would see on, on, you know, in your experience where that would be quite noticeable. Um, so by doing this, uh, it'll only take, you'll, it'll take um, 50 frames to, if you execute two per frame, um, initialize two per frame, in that four millisecond budget. So what that's gonna do is going back to that same goal of keeping the main thread running at 60 frames a second um, and distributing the work across multiple frames. Uh, and this is sort of how that works internally. You've just got a while loop that's adding, it's adding the de delta in time that it took to call the last version of that uh, function call. And then eventually when it, it's greater than that time, it skips out, your frame can continue working and repeat until you tell it to stop. Um, so this is, this is an interesting one that we run into. So a use case for this is that, um, let's say we wanna run a particle system, but we need to let it initialize for a few frames. A single frame is enough because it creates some WebGL textures underneath to store data, and those uh, needs to ping pong between them each frame. Um, so initializer 3 dq sort of solves this by letting the code execute, and then you manually release it when it's done, and that moves on to the next thing. Um, again, ensuring that things don't uh, stack up and they uh, never run at the same time. And again, always going back to that same thing, ensuring you do small bits of work across multiple frames. So uh, this, is, this has been uh, of recent, this is kind of a, a passion project that I've been working on and this is binding uh, WebGL to OpenGL. So we're wanting to get outside the browser, but uh, we also wanna stick with JavaScript uh, for all the reasons I described before. The whole team knows it. Um, we're fast with it. We have a lot of tools. We've basically sort of been building our own version of the equivalent of like Unity in the browser. Um, and it, it, it's always fun to work with, with new languages. So with this particular project, I got to work with Swift, Objective-C, Kotlin, Java, and C++. So it, it's really cool because I find as I use those different languages, I learn things that I bring back to the paradigms that we use in JavaScript. Uh, so here's another video and I can show you some of the stuff. Okay, all right, there it is. So uh, the main driver behind this uh, is to build AR. So uh, right now, web AR is coming. It's actually very close. It will be in browsers, at least on Android this year. Um, but in the meantime, we need to, we wanted to just get into the native stuff, but again, wanting to use JavaScript. So um, these are, the, the, all this code will run on the web when web AR becomes a thing, but right now um, it's able to be compiled inside of a native app. Um, and when this video is done, I will go through how we do that. And I think this, for me, this is sort of the most interesting bit because it's, uh, it's pretty hard and it's pretty fun to figure out. All right. So the core concept when you're doing, you know, trying to, it, it's actually a lot like React um, in the sense that you are initializing a JavaScript engine inside of a native app. Um, and that JavaScript engine by itself doesn't do anything besides execute code. And you have to add features for even the simplest of things such as making a fetch request. Um, so this code is, it just uh, initializes the JS context and then shows what it looks like to literally bind some Swift classes to that JavaScript context for uh, things like fetch and uh, videos and you know, everything else we use. Um, 
WebGL is actually a really close binding to OpenGL. It's not exactly the same. You have to tweak a few things. Um, but it's, it's, it's quite easy, straight, well, not easy, straightforward to implement is a better way. Um, you just have to expose every constant variable. So this is just a snippet within, you know, within um, OpenGL, WebGL. You've got a lot of these. So this is sort of what it looks like to, we have a GL object that exists um, in Swift and in the browser, or in the JavaScript core. And this shows uh, how to store these functions on it. So in this case, uh, for example, G, uh, in the, in the uh, JavaScript context, gl.lines would be the equivalent of gl underscore lines natively. Um, and then, of course, you have every possible function in the WebGL spec. And I spared you, so that way we only have to look at one here. It's, it's a huge file. Uh, but the idea with this was um, I just used some Swift um, closures, and I bind, uh, in this case, it's called create texture. So I bind that to the gl object. So in the browser, you have the gl create texture function. Um, that calls this native code where um, I, use, I do the uh, OpenGL equivalent call that creates a, an object that sort of simulates the object that WebGL would pass back uh, in, the, in a real browser, and then it continues on. One snag I ran into, at least on iOS, uh, was passing large buffers to OpenGL with Swift. This kind of is very similar to the transferable object thing, where you basically have you know, a, a geometry with thousands of points, thousands of uh, vertices. Um, and you need to upload that to the GPU. Um, the idea is that transferable objects are fast because you don't have to make a copy of them. And what I found was that in Swift, it was always making a copy, and I couldn't exactly, there wasn't a lot, there wasn't a lot of stuff on Stack Overflow uh, describing this particular topic. <laughs> so uh, eventually, I, I figured, let me try Objective-C. Um, and the reason for that is I think Objective-C, I'm sorry, the, I know the JavaScript core uh, library is actually is written in Objective C originally. I think a lot of the native iOS stuff originally started off as uh, Objective C. So in this case, there were some functions that I that just didn't seem to work in Swift, uh, such as um, JS value to number, JS value get type pointer, array pointer, and that's that's actually the magic line there. JS value get typed array pointer. Swift has, in, well, actually iOS in general has the worst naming of any language, any framework I've ever dealt with. They're so long, um, but. Yeah, so, so, so doing it this way, what's happening is I'm able to pass the buffer straight to the GPU without having to make a copy of it. Um, and that was useful for, you might have seen in the video, we did a, a little experiment uh, product where you like, did a little drawing app and you drew an AR. And without, with, when, it, when it copied the buffer every frame, every time you would draw and it would change the geometry of that line you were drawing, it would really slow down the user experience. So this made that, this, this one fix, which took a couple days to sort out, um, made, made that app even possible. Cool. So I, uh, I even implemented web workers by initializing another JavaScript core context on a Swift thread. Um, and the communication works exactly the same as it does in a browser. Um, it's a little slower, the implementation, but it definitely works and it's definitely better than nothing. Um, yeah, and, and this, you know, the idea, the idea, it's basically just Swift thread. So you dispatch queue, you call thread async, and then initialize the JSC worker class, which is the one that actually basically does similar to the earlier slide where it initializes a JS context. All right, so that was iOS, and then I had to go do the exact same thing again on Android. So on Android, um, the job was to do the exact same thing, um, but the thing is that Android doesn't have any high-level abstractions like JavaScript core. So what you actually have to do is you have to, you have to um, compile V8 and, and do it all yourself at a really low level using the Android NDK, which is the native developer kit, so that was dope. Um, Actually, what happened was um, a f two years ago in 2016 um, at Google I.O., they introduced Daydream, and I'm like, yeah, dope VR, I want to do this. And so I found, I was like trying to figure out how to do it. I found an open source project called J2V8, which is actually conceptually quite similar to JavaScript core. Um, the only problem with that is calling from JavaScript to J2V8, which then went through C++ and to Java. That was too slow for things like OpenGL bindings. Um, so I actually had all of the OpenGL to WebGL bindings worked out. I had things rendering, and then I'm like, wait a minute, why is it so slow? So that whole project literally just, that was it, throw it away. Um, so uh, last year, I was, when, when Apple came out with ARKit, and then um, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this all over again, try again. I started doing some searching online for how, how to compile V8, and that's not great either. But what I did find was the blog of a 
great dude called Iban, and he's from Spain, and we got together, and I actually uh, worked with him. We contracted him, and you know, he was super into it. He actually had done a similar thing, um, and he was really passionate about uh, based this exact project, binding WebGL to OpenGL. So he helped me get it set up, and once, once he did that, I was able to go through and, in this case, implement uh, the draw arrays instanced function. Um, and you can see how nasty, how nasty this code is. Um, yeah, uh, just it is what it is. But there's a lot of that, and the cool. But but it's really cool. Uh, actually, like two nights ago, I got the uh, I got the new uh, what is it, the Lenovo Mirage Solo, the new like VR headset that's totally standalone. Um, it's got room scale. You can like walk around, and like I got the um, it came, and so I was like, okay. Instead of finishing this, the slides for this talk, I got, I started um, procrastinated by getting a cube <laughs> rendering in in that. So it, it's it's worth it in the end for sure. <laughs> All right, so while we're, while we're on the topic of C++, um, let's talk about WebAssembly. How many people have actually like, heard of WebAssembly or like, all right, nice, yeah, everybody. Cool. So it's supported in all major browsers at this point, and it runs compiled code at near native speeds, which is super dope. Um, it's great if you already have a C++ code base that you want to run on the web, and it's not so great uh, if you want to interface between JavaScript and C++ um, many times per frame, and I think we'll caveat that with it's not so great yet. Um, so, for example, AutoCAD took code that was older than the web itself um, and got it running on the uh, on a web app with WebAssembly. As far as um, that goes, it's pretty cool. They had a big talk about it at uh, Google I/O, and it's pretty awesome. Um, but uh, recently, you know, I've been every now every couple of months, I check back in with WebAssembly, and I'm like, can we do some stuff? And the thing with WebAssembly is, I think I've seen some talks on YouTube, like WebAssembly, the death of JavaScript, and all these things. And that was actually why I was sort of, I don't know, I saw that and I got pissed off and I like tweeted at JSLA, hey, I want to do a talk and talk about why JavaScript's so cool. Because, because for, for us, all the things that I mentioned, like being able to like literally twist the language into a pretzel and the sort of like frictionless nature of being able to do creative coding in JavaScript and the, dealing with so many animations and, and, and needing to build all these tools, JavaScript just lets us do it so fast that I wouldn't want to do it in C++. So like my, you might be able to tell, I go through to go to great lengths to, uh, to make sure I never have to actually use C++ on a regular basis, just abstract it into a box and then use JavaScript for everything else. Um, so I thought it would be really cool, though, to build a 3D engine in C++ and use it in JavaScript, like I just described. Isn't that time to be alive? So this, this, is, what it, this is what it looks like, basically. The first thing I decided, since I got burned on the um, I, since I got burned on the uh, J2v8 stuff, I thought, let me, let me test it out first. Um, and this is just implementing basically a vector three math class in C++ and then exposing it to um, JavaScript. So it's, you know, C++ is nasty. This is only some of it. Um, you can see what you have to do to uh, expose the bindings. Um, this code gets compiled with emscripten, and then that gets converted to a .wasm file. That's a binary, which the emscripten has a quite large library that you have to use on the front end to then pull this in and parse it and make it available to use, which looks like this. Um, it's pretty cool. Like you, you, you're create, when you create up in v3, you're creating a native vector, well, a C++ vector class, and, and it, when you, you pass it back into a function, and in C++ you've declared, your stat, it statically types what you're going to pass in, and, and it all works. So that's pretty exciting. Um, but the problem was that I did a little test, and I initialized 2,000 vector 3 objects, and in th like using a 3JS math class, it took 0 0.2 milliseconds, and with WebAssembly it took 7 milliseconds. Um, and so like a little searching to Mozilla. Basically, right now, it's 100 times slower to pass data between JavaScript and C++ than it actually needs to be. Obviously, this is a thing that they're working on, and they, they sort of built the WebAssembly spec with, as like an MVP approach. So there's going to be improvements to come. Um, and the reason for this is it boils down to sort of the way memory is shared between JavaScript and C++. Like in the native stuff I showed before, you've got JavaScript, you've got uh, C++, and they just communicate directly with each other. In this case, they sort of sit side by side, and you have this shared memory pool. So when you want to send something from JavaScript to C++, EM, that emscripten library is writing into memory, and then the C++ stuff is pulling it out of memory, and vice versa. And right now, it's a bit too slow for our use, which is you know, wanting to write things in JavaScript and use C++. But um, I think there are some examples that, uh, things that we may actually get into a bit further. So a 3D engine is a bad example because in a 3D engine, it's kind of like making, like dealing with a puppet. You're constantly moving the position of everything and making lots and lots of changes. 
something like a physics engine, you make fewer changes and let the thing just run and then read the result. Um, other things like uh, OpenCV, so using like doing like face tracking, making like Snapchat type filters, that sort of stuff um, would definitely be really cool to do in WebAssembly even today. So onto the 3D engine, this is my newest project and biggest project. So um, we've used 3JS for about five years. I personally have learned everything I know about 3D just from using 3JS and reading the source and hacking it and making stuff. Um, over time, we sort of developed a workflow and it became really clear what we need specifically out of a 3D engine. And the thing with 3JS is it offers a ton of features and we actually weren't using most of them. So a lot of that file size was uh, unused code. Um, I, we, I basically completed the 3D engine project um, that's really form fitted to our workflow so, and we kept a lot of the, the patterns that are laid out by 3JS because it, re it really is great. Um, it's written by like super brilliant people who spent a lot of time figuring it out. Um, they really did all the hard work for me in that case. I was able to literally use 3JS as a reference and a few other um, projects as reference to write my own engine. Um, and it's definitely, I think it might be one of the biggest open source projects, definitely JavaScript, biggest open source projects. It's got so many contributors, super smart people, mathematicians, like game engine developers, so many people have contributed. So um, I can't speak highly enough about 3JS. All the examples that you had seen uh, in the previous videos are all built with 3JS. Like if you're interested at all in getting into 3D graphics, like grab a 3JS book, download 3JS, start like making things. It is, it is really ama an amazing engine. Um, but like for us, I was basically able to, and there's still some optimizations I can do, um, but just in like two weeks worth of work, I was basically able to um, double the number of draw calls we can do per frame, um, and that's at 20% of the file size of 3JS. So for, uh, and, and that's just, again, just using um, what, using it the way that we need it. Um, our engine is WebGL 2, and it falls back to WebGL 1, so we get some new extra features that give you a bit more fidelity for effects and also uh, reduce the number of calls you have to make to WebGL. Um, uh, got native OpenGL ES3 support, so that's kind of what I was talking about earlier as far as binding um, JavaScript to OpenGL. Everything conforms uh, to both WebGL 2 spec and the OpenGL ES3 spec, so that's great for native apps, so we're kind of hedging that. Uh, really like super, I'll take this opportunity to go off on a long rant about how the web is dope and how in the future when we're all wearing AR contact lenses and brain implants, like the, the delivery mechanism for those things should be the web. Um, there are some very smart people at like Google, specifically Brandon Jones, who is working very hard on making that a reality. Um, but Apple, of course, is going to do everything it can to uh, keep you in the app store. So we're kind of just hedging those by, with these native app stuff. Um, and so within that, we are ready for some um, next-gen graphics APIs. Uh, so if you know, in the future we want to switch over and render with Vulkan or Metal, we can basically do that quite easily. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Michael. That's fantastic. That's 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 a mind-blowing talk.